the way we will drive this. And uh, for the for the presentation part, I will be doing most of the talking. And um, uh, Kiran would uh, would chip in wherever he feels like, or you know, he he deemed appropriate. Okay, so without further ado, I will uh, I will straight away jump into the discussion, into the into the PPT. So uh, starting with uh, with the agenda. Hold on, I will just put this. Things. Yeah. So uh, this is the agenda on your screen now, and uh, I will start with uh, with Synergy. We are part of Synergy, uh, Azola, and our team. Uh, then, uh, then I will uh, talk a little bit about the shipping. Uh, some of the shipping, uh, you know, different type of ships that we have in the in the in the world today, and uh, how how ships are, you know, how what are the different characteristics of the ship, um, uh, what are the different loads that the ship uh, usually work on, uh, different uh, cargoes that they carry, and uh, you know, and also we will also talk about a little bit about future trends on the ships, like uh, what is the future, you know into alternate fuels or other means of propulsion. Then we will get into the ship structure and its various components. I know, I assume that many of you would be already knowing about ships, uh, their structure, but the same thing is important for the remaining people uh, in the audience to know about ship, uh, various structures of the ship. Why it is important is because uh, we will also talk about, talk about ESDs uh, uh, down in the agenda. And these ESDs are important uh, to be installed on the ship, and we have to understand where these ESDs are going to get installed on the ship. And that is why the ship structure is very important to understand. We'll also talk about uh, decarbonization in shipping, why it is important. And then uh, we will introduce ourselves to ESDs, and uh, we will also talk about uh, the impact of ESDs on the ships. And last but not the least, we will talk about the data, because once the ESDs are installed, we have to understand how they are performing on the ships. Apart from other you know, data that comes from the ships and we will close by by Q&A. Uh, so that is how we will drive our discussion tonight. Good evening, sorry. So talking of. Uh, OK. Yeah, so we call ourselves Synergy. Uh, Synergy is a, one of the biggest uh, ship management company in the world today. Uh, we manage close to 500 ships, uh, more than 400 ships now, and uh, we provide end-to-end -end, uh, ship management solutions to our clients. And uh, uh, we have uh, close to what 19,000 seafarers, strong seafarers uh, in our workforce today. In addition to that, we have a number of uh, office uh, office staff also. And we also have offices in more than 26 locations worldwide. Uh, we started in 2006 and from there onwards till today, we have come a long way. So that is about uh, Synergy. Uh, Azola is a uh, part of Synergy. We are one of the verticals of Synergy. We excel in decarbonization and, uh, and uh, project management solutions of, uh, of, of my maritime industry. Uh, that is a small introduction about uh, our um, Azola and uh, Synergy. Yeah. Uh, then uh, talking about the team uh, on the bottom, you can see uh, the team that it is the it is the core team of of Azola. Uh, we are headed by Mr. Kiran, who is in the discussion tonight, and uh, also uh, we have Mukesh Kenny. He is uh, head of projects. Uh, perhaps he is also part of this uh, webinar. Uh, and then the third one is myself, uh, and the fourth one is uh, Mr. Anand, uh, who is heading the design and engineering department of Azola. So that is the core team of uh, of of Azola. Then, uh, how do we do what we do? Uh, important to know that. Uh, uh, so we have ships. Uh, we have to study the ship, and uh, and we have to make sure that uh, that we make a good decarbonization strategy for the owners. So that is what we do. We 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 understand the ship. We see the potential on the ships, and then we make some kind of a strategy uh, for the owners or the operators. Once that is being finalized, then we get into the detail engineering and you know basic engineering and detail engineering of the ships. Uh, we 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 make we we make uh, plans designs which are uh, in compliance with the class or flag rules. So we do that. Once that is also finalized, then we get into the ship project management of the ships uh, of the project, and uh, we we do project management from from beginning to the end and everything in between. So we do end to end. And you know everything on the, under the project management umbrella, and the last but not least is also about continuous monitoring. We, as I said earlier, we have to know how, the, how things are performing on the ships once they are installed, and for that uh, we have to do continuous monitoring. 
So that is a little bit about introduction. Then I don't know, I'm not able to go to the next slide now. Done. Yeah. Okay. Then I will go to into the introduction of shipping. Uh, uh, this perhaps is uh, is maybe the uh, the biggest section of, of my discussion tonight. Uh, So it is not wrong to say that uh, that uh, shipping is shipping is uh, is uh, it is not wrong to say that shipping is the heart of global trade and economy today. About eighty percent of the shipping, uh, eighty percent of the international trade is done through shipping, and uh, and and it is even more for developing nation. This 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 proportion. Each year we are uh, we are trading about two billion tons of uh, of crude oil, about one billion tons of iron ore. Uh, 350 million tons of grain and 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 whatnot. And here I'm not even talking about container ships. Uh, if we add container ships um, uh, cargo in this uh, in this numbers, the the numbers could be quite staggering and monumental. And uh, so we are talking of huge volumes here, right? And it is not possible to carry this cargo with the help of uh, road, rail, or or air. It will not be economically viable. Uh, shipping is the cheapest mode of transportation. Uh, for ton, um, and it has the lowest uh, environmental footprint per ton basis. Uh, so shipping is is uh, is like you know uh, is is the is the way to go, and also the places which are not uh, accessible to uh, to uh, which are not accessible via via road, rail, or air can be connected through shipping. So through ships, right? So uh, so shipping is quite uh, quite important um, in terms of global trade, right? Since there is some problem with my. Okay, uh, I will talk about uh, about uh, different type of ships now. Uh, uh, we have number of ships uh, in the in the world today, but predominantly there are uh, there are four uh, on on the screen now. Uh, they are container ships, uh, tanker ships, uh, bulk carriers, and gas carriers. So I will talk a little bit about each one of them. Uh, uh, under the container ships, uh, uh, some of the characteristics of container ships are the following. They, of course, we carry containers on these container ships. They have fixed routes uh, usually. Uh, their schedule is also fixed. They have to. They know where they have to reach when, uh, usually. So that is how they are. They, they this is how they operate, and uh, they are the biggest consumers of fuel oil because they have massive engines on board and they also. <laughs> Uh, massive engines on board, and they also have uh, uh, they also uh, uh, consume a lot of heavy uh, fuel oil. Uh, yeah, so that is the biggest consumer. Then we move to tankers. So tankers are the are are uh, where we uh, carry oil in cargo tanks, and they operate in both the spot market and also they work in uh, in fixed routes. And uh, the tankers have uh, have cargo which are which are flammable, right? Then we uh, have bulk carriers. Bulk carriers are the cargo, uh, cargo such as coal, uh, iron ore, coal or grains are carried in, in bulk carriers. They can also have fixed route or they can also have a spot market. Uh, then last is the gas carriers. Uh, gas carriers are the ones where we carry gas uh, in pressurized con condition or maybe in the ambient conditions. And they are also, they can also have fixed route or they can also have the spot market. Yeah, uh, that is about uh, ships. And uh, then uh, Sabu had some special request uh, 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 about uh, about uh, some extra extra information that he wanted me to insert in the slides, because he said that uh, num the majority of the audience here are analytical engineers, and uh, they will be able to connect to this information uh, quite easily. And that is why I wanted to put these uh, these numbers uh, on the screen today, or in the slide today. Uh, so talking of these four type of ships, uh, container ships, uh, the load range of container ships could be in the range of uh, 1100 kilowatts to 700 kilowatts. And uh, this load is uh, being uh, being uh, you know, catered by in generators uh, and they, they can have three to four generators. And uh, the consumers of this load are usually pumps, compressors, reefer plants, etc. So this is about container ships. 
Tanker ships uh, can have the load range between 500 to 800 kilowatts. They can have three to four, three generators uh, typically. And uh, the consumers of the load on tanker ships could be pumps, motor, boilers, IG plants. Uh, bulk carriers are something similar to tanker ships. Uh, again, in the same load range, uh, three generators and, and the compressors are there. Yeah, there are other, uh, you know, uh, the, the consumers could be a little different than the tanker ships. And last is the gas carriers uh, could be a little higher. The load range could be higher than tanker and bulk carriers. And they also have uh, three to four generators and the pumps and motors and real equipation plants are some of the consumers of major consumers of a gas carrier. So, uh, as I said, uh, the load on the on the on the ships. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. We can yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, the load on the ships are uh, are being uh, uh, so there are generators which are actually uh, 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 meeting. Uh, they are the, there to to meet the load of the ships. And uh, so different ships have different loads. Uh, 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 there are also passenger ships where the load could be uh, even more than container ships. And and uh, different even for one particular ship, different loads can be there at different times. For example, when a ship is loading, it can have a different load. Discharging, it can have a different load. Maneuvering, it can have a different load. Anchors can have a different load because at different times, different consumers are in operation. Uh, for example, on a tanker ship during discharging, the boilers are, are running and boilers are the biggest consumers of, 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 of electrical load during discharging operation on a, on a tanker ship. So, so different times, different loads. Uh, on the ship, we consume heavy fuel oil as uh, maybe 90% of the times we use heavy fuel oil as the, as the fuel to burn on the ship uh, uh, for power generation. Apart from the heavy fuel oil, we also have MGO, marine gas oil. We also have ULSFO, ultra low sulfur fuel oil. And we also can have LNG as the fuel for marine applications. Uh, in the future, uh, we are also looking at uh, methanol, uh, ammonia and hydrogen as uh, yeah, basically right now we are, you know, there are a number of projects going on around the world where we are, uh, we are uh, either uh, building methanol ships or we are converting ships to methanol. So this project is already uh, underway in many places in the world. For ammonia and hydrogen, uh, the research is going on and uh, maybe there are some ships in the world uh, which are already running on ammonia, but uh, they may not be in the commercial, you know, normal commercial operation in the, in the, in the, in the market now. Uh, for the refueling, uh, refueling is something also called as bunkering in shipping term. Uh, bunkering and uh, this is done through through the ship's manifold in the next slide i will talk about about how it is being done this is very simple uh, nothing uh, nothing special about that yeah then uh, here you can see uh, on the left you can see some of the big big consumers of the electrical load on the ship uh, there are many i have just uh, put uh, three pictures here the first one is a is a windlass which is used for uh, for tying the ship to the to the shore once it is uh, loading or discharging it can take a lot of load uh, sorry it can take a lot of power to to operate then the next one is the electrical boiler which is uh, which is a big boiler um, and it is used for cargo discharging in a tanker ship and it can also be the one of the biggest consumers of electrical electrical power then uh, on the ship we have uh, we have uh, pumps, motors, uh, you know, for different applications, and they can also be the uh, they can also be very big consumers of electrical load on on a, on a trip on a, on a ship. Uh, then uh, the top right you see a picture with a with a big ship and a small uh, small barge, small ship, and this is what uh, usually a bunker. Uh, this is how the bunkering happens on the ship. Uh, the small ship comes with the fuel and it uh, connects to the big ship via the manifold uh, through the piping and uh, it pumps the oil into the big ship and this is how the, the big ship gets the fuel. So this is, uh, this is how it is being done, you know, bunkering, uh, refueling, for example, uh, yeah, for instance. Then the next one is the heavy fuel oil. Uh, this is uh, how the fuel looks like on the ship. Uh, this is thick, viscous black oil, uh, which is uh, uh, which is which we use for for marine applications. And this uh, this uh, uh, we you don't want to to spill this oil because if it spills, it can get very very messy. You know, it is very difficult to clean this oil. Uh, 
then uh, sabu also wanted me to talk a little bit about transformers uh, i am not an expert of transformers but i can show you how a typical transformer looks like on a on a on a tanker ship and some of the specification of tanker ships uh, sorry of the of the of the transformer is there on the right so yeah so you can go through that um, and as i said i i don't want to uh, deep dive into this because i am not the expert of that then there were few more things that uh, uh, that uh, that was uh, sorry if i may interrupt i think you know uh, since uh, first of all good evening to all of you uh, my name is kiran uh, since i mean we are talking and we are you know not that much aware of what uh, the participants are aware of shipping so probably we could take a pause and check if you know everything is being understood if there are any questions at this point in time because probably you know uh maybe there will be a few questions popping up in their mind so probably you can take a pause and uh, ask people if there is something that they would like to ask or we could just you know uh, go with the flow yeah uh, mr uh, mr manish i would like to know what is the refurb plan then the one what is ig plan that you have shown in the previous slide yeah uh, actually uh, uh, kiran we wanted to take questions in the end uh, but uh, uh, but since uh, this question has come up <clears throat> i will take it uh, ig plant is actually for uh, for uh, uh, for producing the inert gas in a tanker ship uh, and this inert gas is something that is uh, there on the it is on top of the cargo in the tank because it's little technical you know so we have we have a cargo tank where we have the we have the oil in the tank and it on the 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 air over the over the top of the of the of the liquid is filled up with ig it is basically the the uh, it is a fire mitigation uh, you know measure because if the air on top of the tank is is oxygen then it can it can catch fire so we pump that, we we fill that area with the ig yeah uh, which is called inert gas right uh, so that the the chances of fire reduces or it is and, mitigated completely yeah manish if, if i take a stab at it uh, i think it's a, it's a good question you know it depends upon what cargo we are carrying so on a tanker you carry flammable cargo most of the time so when you carry flammable cargo the cargo releases vapor and this is this is quite flammable but if you understand the flammability triangle you know you need three things to catch fire one is the fuel second is air and third is a ignition right so the fuel is always there and ignition could be anything you know because of uh, any friction or anything that could be there could be ignition so one thing that you can really control is the oxygen content so in order to re keep the oxygen content below a level where you know there could not be a ignition there could not be a flame so that's why we put inert gas into the tank so that all the space that is on top of the cargo is filled with inert gas and there is no oxygen or very little oxygen so that you know even in case of a uh, of a spark or something there is no chance there is no risk that there would it would catch fire so that is why we have uh, inert gas and the way to do inert gas is we have plants where the, where we use the boiler flue gas because it contains a lot of carbon dioxide or we have a burner where we use fuel to burn and produce carbon dioxide and this uh, this gas it is cooled and clean and then sent into the tanks to which acts as a inert gas so it it is something that is used uh, on tanker ships yeah and the next one was about the reliquification re okay uh, is that okay is that clear to you sir the reefer plan reefer plan reefer plan yeah uh, you are talking about the uh, this uh, reefer plant right uh, so yeah, they, yeah. on the on the container ships uh, we have the cargo which are refrigerated uh, right and uh, uh, we have uh, normal containers we have the refrigerated containers and then this refrigerated containers needs to uh, to to stay cool right and for that we have a reefer plant which is a normal uh, refrigeration plant big one because they have they, it's not have to it it have to cater to number of 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 containers on board right it can go up to thousands of containers so we have a dedicated reefer plant on container ships which will uh, which will uh, which will make these containers refrigerated you know it will keep them cool and that is what reefer plants are for container ships right 
and for the reliquification plants for the gas carriers this is something like you know when when the gas is carried in the tanks it it is it it can have boil off so this boil off have to be reliquified and and that for for that purpose we have the reliquification plants on board so yeah so that's how it is In, the, in order to liquefy, you need to have uh, lower temperatures now for gas to liquefy it has to be kept at a very low temperature. Yeah, so the plant does that, right? Okay, okay. okay. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Sir, the IG plant, uh, when we are using this carbon dioxide, how much volume will, will, will you are providing for this uh, uh, oil containers? Uh, what, what do you mean by uh, volume? Can you can you elaborate? That, that means if if a if a tanker container is full hundred percent oil, that will be there are chances of inflammability. So we are uh, filling some CO2 above it. So how, what is the percentage of the filling of CO2 above it? See, it all depends upon how much you have filled the tank. Normally, a tank is not filled up to hundred percent because you have to leave a space for expansion and stuff. So say if you have filled the tank up to 95%, the remaining 5% is filled with inert gas. And when we say inert gas, probably your question is also about what is the oxygen content. So normally the oxygen content is you know, kept below 5%. So that even in case of some air ingress, the, the chance of uh, you know, the mixture becoming flammable is, is not that high. So whatever space on top of the cargo, say if the tank, say if you have to sometimes discharge cargo and the tank is not 100% full say it is 50% full so normally we don't keep slack tanks but just as an example so all the remaining space on top of the cargo is filled with this inert gas okay thank you sir yeah the inert gas content has oxygen levels which are so low that it will not promote any flame uh, i mean ignition ignition yeah okay great uh, then uh, any more questions uh, so far or i can uh, i can i can continue please continue okay thank you uh, okay then uh, i was here uh, so uh, so i want to talk a little bit about the electrical uh, features of uh, of the of the system uh, on the ship so we have these uh, there are a number of electrical safety uh, features uh, on the ships i will just uh, I've just put two of them here. One is called air circuit breakers, uh, and the other one is preferential trips or overload protections. So for the air circuit breaker, it interrupts the flow of electrical current when uh, when there is a fault. And I think uh, I think it's nothing new for you guys also. Um, uh, pretty simple stuff. And then uh, we have preferential trips. So let's say if the if the load on the ship increases, then we will have some of the consumers which will just trip, and uh, and protect the 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 the, the system. Uh, again, I will uh, not get uh, too deep into this because um, uh, maybe you guys know more than what I do. So yeah, so that is how it is. Uh, then also, Sabu wanted me to uh, wanted me to answer a few questions uh, in his uh, in his requirements as part of his requirement. So the questions are down below in the next uh, table. Uh, the first one was about uh, whether the oil tanker can be used as storage tanker. So the answer to that is yes, it is possible to use the oil tanker as storage tanker. Uh, but uh, I have not uh, come across any ship which can also supply this uh, to overhead cable or 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 something like that. So uh, so until Kiran, if you know something about this, then uh, it's okay. Otherwise, I do not know if the oil tanker can supply oil to some overhead cable or or for that uh, something like that. Yeah. Then uh, next question was about uh, whether the ships can be used as stationary power generation. Yes, it is possible to use uh, ships uh, for uh, power generation. Uh, there are many places where ships are used for this by application. But then uh, we also have to understand that the ships need to have special equipment for doing this. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the next question was whether the ship can be used to generate hydrogen uh, since the ship is always in the water. Well, I have not again come across any ships which can produce hydrogen on board. There are hydrogen generators on the ship, but uh, but uh, 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 but again, it, it 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 is a it is a special equipment that is there on the ship. Uh, maybe in the future development, we can have something like that. Uh, but uh, so far, I have not come across it. 
I, what I mean to say that the, that the technology is not so matured now at this point in time. Then about anti-piracy measures, uh, he wanted me to talk a little bit about that. So yeah, uh, 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 when the ship is, uh, is passing through the piracy areas, we have to be extra careful and uh, we should have some reserve power on board uh, just in case we want to start one uh, extra pump or maybe some extra lighting on the ship. Uh, so it's important that the ships need to have some reserve power. And for that purpose, we keep some uh, one of the generators, extra generators on on the load. And so that in case we uh, we have to start something, uh, some, uh, some heavy consumer of, uh, of power, then we don't have to run around. Yeah, so that is why we have to be careful when uh, extra careful when we are passing through the piracy areas. So if, if I have to add a few things uh, on that, uh, say, if I go from if I go bottom up for anti piracy, yes, there are certain areas which are marked as piracy areas. So while you are there, you take uh, preventive measures. You have, uh, say, barbed wire which is put around the vessel so that any pirates, if at all they attempt to board the board the vessel, that is discouraged. There are uh, fire pumps, high pressure pumps which are kept running, and sometimes you have water spraying on the sides of the ship so that that would uh, discourage. And while you are in the piracy areas, you go at high speed so that you know no vessel uh, smaller vessel, vessels are not able to catch up with you but but of course yes the smaller high speed crafts would be always faster than than a tanker vessel or something now when we talk about tanker vessels there are certain ships which have less freeboard that means the the distance between the water level and the ship is not that much you know so that becomes an easy target for uh, for pirates to to, you know to get on the ship so like tankers they have low freeboards maybe a bulk carrier would have low freeboard uh, freeboard is the you know distance between the water line and the ship's deck or on top of the ship so uh, but for a container ship or a car carrier where the freeboard is very high the chances of you know uh, pirates boarding would be less but that doesn't mean they don't do that uh, we all know uh, say all kinds of vessels are getting attacked by pirates and there is also a possibility to have armed guards. It's normally, the ship staff, not normally, ship staffs are not allowed to carry any uh, arms and ammunition on ships. So there could be possibility that certain armed guards could be boarding the vessels so that you know you have the right uh, protection if if uh, the company chooses to do that. Next comes to the generating hydrogen on vessels. I think we all know hydrogen is a very uh, say. Uh, flammable uh, material so production of hydrogen and you know controlling hydrogen is something that is being looked into of course yes there is a lot of uh, water the ships are floating in in sea water so something where we can generate hydrogen uh, is something that probably is being looked into however till now it's still in research and development stage so we don't have a vessel that produces hydrogen now then next the the other two questions i think you know uh, manish what uh, uh, they would like to know is if it is a possibility that you know we have an oil tanker that is anchored at one place and we could have some kind of power generation so if it is an lng ship so rather, that, that, rather than having a shore facility could a lng tanker be stationed near a port and could it generate power and could that power be supplied to uh, to shore uh, theoretically yes it is possible uh, and I think there, there could be a couple of ports where the infrastructure is not that great. Uh, maybe a tanker or maybe a ship is providing that kind of uh, uh, power supply. Yeah, that is possible. Uh, but yes, uh, again, a floating vessel with a lot of rules and regulation, I think it would be better if the infrastructure is ashore rather than having a ship to supply uh, power to, to shore. Sir, can I add one point regarding three, point number three? I am Anil. Yeah, sure, Anil. Um, so I am a researcher in uh, renewable energy and uh, sustainability. <clears throat> so as yeah. regards uh, generating hydrogen by vessels, I feel you now what is uh, currently going on state of the technology is that you now we have to uh, decarbonize the transportation industry. So uh, in, in the process of decarbonization, uh, we need to have uh, solar panels fixed all over the top of the vessel so that uh, solar generation happens uh, in the ship on board and this solar energy uh, can be used for the ship 
to power the needs of uh, electric power, then we can con convert the additional solar generated electricity to hydrogen and store it uh, as part of, uh, you know, as hydrogen serves the purpose of an, of an energy carrier. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Neil, actually, uh, very right. Uh, I think my next slide is on a little bit about that solar panels also. But uh, uh, the storage of hydrogen is a, is a big challenge. Uh, we have not really uh, reached far with that uh, storage of hydrogen. It is highly flamm flammable uh, material, as Kiran said. And uh, I know that I have a reading somewhere that we have hydrogen generators on the ship. Uh, how the hydrogen is produced could be uh, could be uh, it can be produced through ele uh, through electrolysis uh, uh, by using some uh, renewable source of energy like like you said the solar or something like that. So yeah, uh, this is again uh, in the future development, and uh, it it may not be very far when we can use uh, something like this in our ships. Yeah, so I will continue uh, in the interest of time. Uh, Please continue. Yeah, yeah, okay. Then uh, uh, for the future development of marine power, uh, we have uh, uh, this one is about that. Uh, we have ammonia. Uh, like we said about hydrogen, we also have to talk about ammonia when once we are talking about hydrogen. Ammonia is perhaps the, is the future fuel, alternate fuel that uh, that may come uh, very soon uh, and, uh, and our future ships can be propelled by ammonia. Uh, ammonia, when it burns, it does not emit carbon dioxide. It is, uh, it is the problem with ammonia is that it is highly flammable and it is also toxic. Otherwise, ammonia has all the characteristics of being a marine fuel. Then uh, there is something called uh, vessel kite. Uh, these are huge kites uh, which uh, when deployed on the ship uh, can, uh, can tap into the wind energy and uh, it can help in the, in the propulsion of the ships. Then Anil, uh, uh, regarding a point, solar panels, you can see it on the screen now. So these are something that uh, will uh, will help in uh, reducing our uh, fuel consumption by if we put a lot of uh, solar panels on the on the on the on the open area on the ship, it will certainly aid in uh, in power uh, power uh, power saving. Then uh, the next one is the flatter rotor. We call it flatter rotor, and these are the high towers that you see on the deck. On uh, if I don't know if I'm able to use my my, my mouse here, but yeah, these are the top uh, top uh, the uh, these uh, towers on the ship. And I'm happy to inform you all that uh, that Synergy uh, as a company are already producing this uh, this Flatner rotor uh, in house. And how they work is uh, that they 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 are big they, they are big towers. They 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 rotate and they tap into wind energy, and thereby it is uh, propelling it is aiding in the propulsion. Uh, I will not go into the technicality of this, but uh, you can always uh, find some 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 literature on the in the in the in um, in the, in the websites. Then we have fuel cell. A fuel cell is nothing new, uh, but then we want to use this fuel cells into marine applications uh, safely. And uh, here also we can produce, uh, uh, you know, hydrogen also comes in the fuel cells. So uh, this is important to know how, how we can use fuel cells into, into marine applications. Uh, there are already some ships, small ships, uh, maybe some, uh, some ferries or, uh, you know, some pleasure yachts on fuel cells. But I do not know any big commercial ships uh, or maybe a container ships are being propelled by fuel cells at this point in time. Then uh, we have wind sails. Uh, uh, these are like big uh, uh, deployable wind sails. They are made of special material, uh, light material, strong material. Uh, in older days, we used to have wind sails made of fabric or cloth. Uh, and these uh, wind sails are uh, self deployable it has its own mechanism to deploy and also it has some weather uh, you know weather systems and you know and all of that so uh, so this is also being developed uh, uh, as we speak about marine uh, future uh, power yeah that is about uh, uh, future technologies uh, any questions so far guys uh, you want to talk uh, you want something some burning questions so far <laughs> Sir, the Flatner rotor, where yeah. is the rotor situated? This is a cylindrical pipe. In which location it will be situated? See, uh, you see, this is the ship. This is the deck of the ship, uh, the, the top part. And these are mounted on the deck. These are the, the top four, uh, the, the four towers that you see on the deck. They are the Flatner rotors. Yeah. 
and it has a kiran would you like to take this please if you don't mind yes of course uh, yeah i think it's it's a very good question uh, flatner rotor it's kind of a brand name but it, it could also be called as rotor sales what happens is these are uh, big cylindrical towers maybe around 25 meters in height and about 5 meters or 2 6 meters in diameter so this this spun continuously and there is something called as the magnus effect so if there is a, a say cylinder that is turning at a particular velocity and if there is wind blowing across it it produces a force which could be uh, in perpendicular you know uh, direction so if you have these rotors which are uh, run by motors so if there is enough wind then it can produce a thrust which will move the vessel forward coming back to your question where these are located of course these will be located on the deck so that you know they have uh, exposure towards uh, towards wind so the challenge with flatner rotors is something like a container ship where you have containers that are stacked quite high uh, deployment of these rotors could be difficult uh, vessels with clean deck something like a roro ferry or or a tanker ship or a bulk carrier is much more feasible for for these kind of installations uh, yeah does that make it clear does that help yes yes, could... yes it's clear it's clear yeah. so these are huge uh, towers uh, if you can imagine you know 25 meters by uh, 25 meters in height and around 5 meters in diameter yeah okay great uh, then i will continue uh, uh... just one more thing uh, manish yeah sure uh, i think you know mr anil had commented about uh, the solar panel i yeah. think it is quite good it is something that you know the vessels could definitely use however the the surface area that is required and again this is my point of view the surface area that is required because a vessel is supposed to carry cargo and uh, the most of the area on the deck or the ship uh, is required for carrying cargo or for cargo movement so the area that is available for putting this solar panels is limited and compared to the area that is available and the power it can generate so <clears throat> the 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 potential is there however it is limited but there are kind of research there is kind of development happening where you you could have a film of uh, solar panels so these things are happening as we speak as we talk there are a lot of things that are happening so for example i mentioned about hydrogen as fuel so it's not just the fuel it's not just the technology that we should be talking about it's also about how cheap is it today is it mature is it easily available if you look at hydrogen probably hydrogen as a gas is available but is that hydrogen produced by using fossil fuel so it's the total uh, sum of you know uh, say the carbon footprint like we call it in in shipping it is called well to wake right from the the energy that is required to make produce this fuel to the consumption part hydrogen as such doesn't have any uh, emissions but to produce hydrogen if you are using fossil fuels it doesn't solve the purpose so a lot of things yeah. are required not sure. just the technology also the infrastructure do we have hydrogen as fuel that is readily available lng as fuel that is readily available so the most important development for now we are looking at is the biofuels uh, methanol and also lng so the next thing is about you know having making this fuel available at various ports at various uh, junctions where the vessel can you know refuel itself for uh, commercial purposes yeah sure yeah and uh, i will just continue on this a little bit on uh, ammonia for example uh, in the in the today's uh, world ammonia is usually gen- usually produced from uh, from the natural gases uh, and uh, we need to understand like uh, like the uh, like we can have ammonia on the ship it can burn and it will not have any carbon uh, carbon emissions but how is it is being produced it also needs to be looked into so the whole uh, the value chain of ammonia has to be green otherwise it will not make any sense same goes for biofuel uh, biofuel are produced by 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 uh, uh, you know uh, uh, on the you know, in the in the land side by by maybe decaying of some of these you know plants or you know uh, some some crops or something but for producing the biofuel we should not be cutting some forest uh, in some part of the world otherwise this biofuel has no meaning you know uh, because we have uh, we have cut down some trees to prepare the or to produce the biofuel 
So the whole value chain should be green, otherwise it will have no sense. Yeah, I will then continue. Sir, one, yes, one, yes, yeah, sure. one thing, yeah, please. Sure, sure. Um, sir, a green hydrogen that is produced from solar or any renewable sources, it can be combined with nitrogen uh, and using Haber process at 800 degrees Celsius, if you convert that nitrogen and I mean combine, allowed to combine nitrogen and the green hydrogen, we can produce ammonia, ammonia. which is E ammonia yeah. called E, yeah. e ammonia yeah. means uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, green, green ammonia. Uh, green ammonia. <laughs> yeah, that is green ammonia. Similarly, yeah, yeah. The carbon dioxide that is sequestered in carbon capture and uh, storage technologies could be utilized to. Uh, produce uh, methanol that is e methanol that is green methanol from uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, hydrogen so that way e methanol and e ammonia can be produced from green hydrogen yeah yeah sure uh, that is uh, that is very right uh, but uh, 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 but we also have to be mindful of the of the fact that uh, these are uh, i mean we have to make sure that these are commercially viable like Kiran mentioned, that is, do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the economies of scale? Do we have the, uh, you know, can we have the application uh, uh, to cater to the big engine that we have on the ship? Can it uh, travel the distance that we are doing? You know, let's say from India to to America, uh, can it travel to let's say it can can it have 30 days voyage? You know, so th there are a number of uh, factors that we have to be you know mindful of before we say that yes, ammonia or hydrogen can be the next future fuel. Yeah, so there are a lot of this uh, practicality that uh, that comes in, right? That that uh, that uh, that uh, plays a big role. But I think uh, Mr. Anil, uh, you, you make a very good point, very valid point. And since you mentioned that you are researching into this, obviously uh, you know much better than us. What we are trying to point out here is this will need some time to get the technology matured to to make it available readily available at a price that is you know uh, far better and far more economical than the current fuel that we are using or regulations that discourage the use of uh, fossil fuels so yes these kind of research these kind of developments are required and there are a lot of companies there are a lot of uh, entities that are looking forward to to fund this to sponsor this to support this and people like you who are researching this this is how uh, it needs to proceed and at a faster pace so that you know we we get to this zero carbon shipping as soon as possible uh, i think you know there are few companies few entities who are looking to decarbonize shipping by 2050 even today in a seminar we heard that you know uh, maybe imo that is international maritime organization which governs the world shipping is trying to be a bit more ambitious in carbon reduction uh, targets and probably we'll see that you know that more funding more efforts are put in these research and development so that we get a good solution at the earliest i think you bring a very valid point things are possible but it needs to be uh, developed further so that it is readily and say uh, and economically available for for commercial uh, usages yeah okay i will then move on uh, i will now uh, get into the ship structure and various components uh, we were talking about letter rotor and we were talking about uh, deck and all so here we can have uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, information about how the ship uh, looks like what are the different structures of the ship etc so on the screen you can see uh, one model of a ship from hypercloid this is a container ship uh, uh, like and uh, yeah so now i will talk about uh, various parts of the ship uh, maybe for uh, those who don't uh, know too much about about how ships are how different structures are uh, then uh, they can get uh, some good information here. So this is the hull of the ship. Uh, this is the, the main steel body uh, of the ship uh, uh, all around. This is called hull. Then uh, the engine room of the ship is uh, usually located towards the end of the ship, uh, towards the aft part of the ship. And all the big machineries, major machineries are towards the, towards the aft of the ship. We have the propeller here. This is the fan uh, that you usually see on 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 ships, uh, big fans, not not small fans. Uh, and this is one that uh, will uh, will drive the ship forward or aft. When it uh, moves, it the ship goes up uh, forward or, or 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 aft or behind. Then we have the rudder. Uh, this is the rudder of the ship. Uh, the rudder of the ship is the one which will maneuver the ship uh, left or right. 
um, the, let's say if the ship has to turn right, the rudder has to also turn right. Okay. But any questions so far? Please, uh, please interrupt me. I, I can answer. Uh, then uh, uh, this is the bridge of the ship. This is on the. Uh, in, this is uh, on top of the of the accommodation area. This is from. This is the place from where the the navigation happens. The captain of the ship or uh, the navigating officers of the ship maneuver or navigate the ship from here. And all the all the navigation equipment are are situated in this part of the of the ship. Then. Uh, Underneath the, the the bridge, we have the accommodation area. This is the quarters where uh, the crew live. So during the tenure uh, during their tenure on the ship. So this is the the livable area of the of the ship. Uh, here you have the cabins and and you know other 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 uh, like uh, like mess room, galley and and you know laundry and everything in this part of the ship. Uh, this is the funnel of the ship where uh, where uh, from where the emissions uh, pass so once the engine is running uh, so all the emissions will go out from the ship from the funnel this is the deck area uh, so as we were discussing before kiran said that uh, on a this is a container ship right so on the container ship uh, there is no place to put a flattener rotor right uh, the whole area is filled up with containers the cargo so where would you put a, a flatner rotor? So this is quite challenging to put a flatner rotor on a on a on a container ship, unlike unlike a tanker or a, or, a, or a bulk carrier. So this is the deck area. The whole the whole place from forward to the aft is all deck area. On top of the hull. And then this is the colluded cargo. Uh, the, all the cargo is there on the deck and also on the container ship, which is also underneath the deck. And then uh, the, the the forward part, uh, the, you see a small protruding part outside, uh, protruding outside, which is called a bulbous bow. Apart from these various uh, things on the ship, we also have many other things. I don't want to get into uh, you know every nitty gritty of the ship because it will take uh, uh, maybe perhaps maybe a few hours. Uh, so, so this is these are the main uh, components of the ship or main parts of the ship. It is good to understand this because uh, next I will talk about or maybe after a couple of slides I will talk about ESDs. ESDs are nothing but energy saving devices, and these are the ones which are going to install on the ship uh, in different parts. So it's good for you to know how the ship looks like. Yes, uh, any questions? Of I guess no. So I will move on. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I will talk about decarbonization shipping. Uh, why it is important? Uh, uh, so we cannot agree more. We couldn't agree more that uh, we have to decarb uh, uh, the shipping and we have to do it fast. Uh, why? Because uh, because we have uh, huge amount of ships, uh, you know, uh, plying in our oceans. Uh, about sixty thousand ships are there in the world. And uh, they can be of different types and different uh, efficiency levels and and what have you. So there are a number of ships on the, in the, in the, in on the on the on the planet now, and they right now they are emitting about three percent of the of the greenhouse gases uh, of the you know uh, of of the of the world. So and if nothing happens, if nothing, uh, if everything stays same and uh, and the status quo remains, then this can increase to two fifty percent of what it is today. So we have to be mindful of this fact that we have to do something on the shipping also. Uh, and if uh, if the if the emissions are not controlled, then the then the coastal states and coastal areas of the world, uh, the the ocean can become toxic or acid acidic, and it can have a very adverse effect on the on the, on the maritime uh, on the marine life uh, around that area. So we have to do uh, decarbonization fast, and it is not wrong to say. That ocean uh, carriers play a pivotal role and very critical role in the in uh, reducing the overall carbon footprint of uh, of of the industry. So decarbonization is is quite critical, and it is uh, it is uh, we uh, perhaps are sitting on a time bomb, and if we don't do too much uh, too soon, then uh, it can it can have very bad effects. Then I will talk about uh, ESDs. Uh, what are ESDs? Uh, ESD, as I said, it is called energy. It is the short form of energy saving devices, and these are something that uh, these are nothing but equipment or, or some modification that we do on the ship, which will make the ship uh, efficient. 
Uh, on the screen, you can see some of the ESDs that we uh, we usually put on the ship. Uh, uh, starting from the left, uh, this is a propeller, an optimized propeller. It is uh, it is probably a little lighter than uh, than uh, the original one that we that the ship was built with. And if the if the propeller is lighter, then it will uh, it is quite obvious that uh, that it will consume less uh, power to to rotate. So, uh, so this is a propeller. Uh, we put up optimized propeller, and thereby we increase the efficiency of the of the ship. The second picture over here is of a pre-swirl device, which is also uh, which is a duct basically, and this is fitted on the first picture. You can see the duct is fitted in the in the forward part of the propeller, and uh, this will help in also uh, efficiency gains by 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 uh, routing the or maybe directing the flow of the water into the propeller so thereby increasing the efficiency of the propeller so these are this is another uh, thing that we can install on the ship uh, uh, and then we have something called a post swirl device which is a small fan behind the propeller this will also help we can also have a low friction coating uh, you know the ship is coated with paint it has paint on the on the hull and it has a resistance to overcome uh, the water resistance. And uh, if we have a low friction paint or a coating on the on the hull, the resistance will be lesser, and then the efficiency of the of the ship will be better. Uh, then uh, another one which is very simple. Uh, it's a no brainer. Uh, we can have a LED lighting on the ship. Uh, we can change all the, our conventional lighting by LED lighting. It will have a big uh, gains in the electrical power uh, saving. Uh, then we also have something called ultrasonic protection devices, uh, which are nothing but transducers, which we install in the ship. And these transducers are something that will emit uh, ultrasonic waves, sound waves uh, on the hull and the propeller. And all the all the marine growth, such as uh, barnacles, uh, mussels, uh, tube worms, all these which stick to the to the hull and the propeller, and thereby making it uh, heavy, uh, can be prevented by using these ultrasonic devices. Uh, you know, if if the propeller becomes heavy, it will require more energy for it to turn, right? And thereby, these uh, these devices are the ones which are uh, which are protecting the or preventing the the barnacles and this heavy growth, marine growth, to attach to the hull and the propeller. Then we also have something called CGC filters. These CGC filters are something which will uh, which will fuel which will uh, purify the lube oil and thereby increase the efficiency of the engine and uh, and aid in the fuel efficiency. Apart from this. Uh, uh, ESDs that we see on the screen, there are a number of other uh, stuffs uh, that we can uh, propose depending upon how the ships are, how much investment that the ship owner wants to put on their ships, and what are their their targets. How soon do they, do they want to reach their you know decarbonization levels? Uh, so, yeah, any questions so far on these uh, ESDs? Where we are fixing these ultrasonic devices? This is uh, uh, e ultrasonic devices are are, are uh, mounted inside the engine room. It is not mounted on the outside. It is inside the inside the engine room, uh, near the near the aft part of the ship. Or it can be put anywhere. Uh, if you want to prevent the marine growth in the forward part of the ship, we can put it on the forward part of the ship also. But it is all fitted inside the inside the ship. Not outside the ship, and it is very easy application. It is very easy to to mount them. It has a glue. You put a you you clean the surface. You put a glue or something like that, and then you stick it on the on the hull, and it and it will do the work. It has a control system, and then that is it. Very simple to install. Ultrasonic so protection. If if yeah. I may take a call here. Yeah, so, sure. So what happens with ultrasonic devices? These are transducers. So what you can see in the photo is is a transducer. This is stuck on the surface through which you want to transmit those ultrasound waves. So basically, this was done for heat exchangers uh, because you know the seawater that is passing through the heat, heat exchangers they used to get fouled because of marine growth. So if this can protect, say, the heat exchangers, coolers that are required on a ship, because ship, if you look at the engine room, it's more like a small factory where you have different kind of plants. There are heaters, there are coolers where you are using seawater or fresh water to cool uh, the other, uh, say, liquid. So there, this helps in uh, not letting the microorganisms stick to the surfaces and, you know, they start growing. So a similar application is done on, on the propeller. So this same thing, 
uh, you know it is it is put on the aft side that is you know inside the engine room but near closer to the propeller and through the shaft these ultrasound waves propagate and they don't let the microorganisms stick on the surface of the propeller and a clean propeller means that the propeller is light the propeller is efficient so that it maintains the efficiency of the propeller you have to remember that the the ship uh, is, is is in water all the time and there is a very big possibility that the ship surface and for that matter the surface of the propeller can get fouled due to microorganism or what we call as marine growth so this prevents it and another thing that i would like to add here is for a ship you know that we have a main engine which is used for propulsion and then there are auxiliary engines which are used for power generation which goes for you know running the pumps and lighting etc so it's not a rule of thumb but around 90% of the fuel consumption is by the main engine for propulsion so if you look at what kind of energy devices are more are the most effective are the ones that can save the fuel of the main engine fuel consumption of the main engine it can be some improvement which can improve the efficiency of the engine or to a large extent if we can improve the efficiency of the propulsion so what happens in propulsion we have a propeller can we do something to the propeller that can increase the propeller efficiency and then when you leave the propeller if you look at the pre swirl device that helps you know the water to be flowing towards the eye of the propeller that improves improves your uh, propeller efficiency then you look at the hull so we all know when we have when we see uh, cars or yachts that are designed they are aerodynamically designed so or they are very smooth so if you have a hull surface which is very smooth then that also helps in keeping the propulsion efficiency at a maximum level so you have paints which are applied to the ship's hull you have performance paints you have high grade planes that maintain the hull in very good condition but in case you have a hull growth that happens on the surface of the ship what you do is you periodically stop the vessel you clean the hull there are divers who go close to the vessel they clean the hull so that the hull is clean because this increases the fuel consumption by 10% or 20% and sometimes even more so keeping the hull clean is very important so these are few things that can maintain the efficiency of the ship and to a certain extent also improve the efficiency of a vessel so what we do as part of our job is we try to evaluate what kind of technologies what kind of equipment is going to improve the efficiency or maintain the efficiency of the ship so these are a few examples that do exactly that so yeah. what does cjc means cjc means in cjc filters cjc it is a brand name you don't have to go with the name it is called cjn so it's a danish company that's the brand name yeah. what yeah. really is a paper filters it's fine paper which keeps the lubricating oil in good condition so if you have a good lubricating oil your engine efficiency is maintained and on ships we have something called as purifiers uh, it, these are high you know fast rotating uh, equipment which separates the oil and water and oil and you know whatever particles you have or whatever dirt you have in the oil so that requires power to to run the purifiers so if you separate if you replace them with cjc filters these are stationary uh, equipment with a small pump that is you know making the oil flow through it so your fuel consumption for running the purifier is reduced and these are better as compared to the purifier in terms of keeping the oil in clean condition so this is a very small uh, say example or it doesn't have a huge impact on the fuel but it has some impact on fuel sales yeah okay uh, thanks kiran uh, so this is on the next one is on the 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 enormity of the saving uh, actually so since you said that uh, the, everything has some uh, some fuel saving potential so esds can be divided or segmented into various categories uh, hull related uh, esds which will uh, impact the saving uh, by being on the hull hull side of the ship then we have the fuel related uh, esds uh, and then we can categorize one more kind which is called uh, others so on the hull side we can have the pre swirl device uh, which is a uh, duct we can also have a new propeller new design propeller we can have the post uh, swirl device we can have ultrasonic protections 
uh, we can have a modification to the bow of the ship. We can have a bulbous bow. We can have premium paint, as Kiran mentioned. We can have something like a like you know uh, uh, low friction paints, and we also can have air lubrication. There are various technologies which will be uh, you know uh, aiding into the fuel efficiency. And uh, then we have for the fuel related, we can have additives, fuel additives that we can put on the in the fuel. We can have some SFOC. SFOC stands for uh, specific fuel oil consumption. Uh, yeah, I think I'm right on that. And then we have uh, something called shaft generator, fine filters, LED lighting, uh, variable frequency dri uh, dri dri drives for motors. Uh, we ha can have thin lube, uh, blending on board, bob. So there are a number of things, as I said, it is not only five, six of them. There are the, the, the list could be uh, can run into maybe 25 to 30 different uh, technologies that we can install on the ship. And if you on the right, you can see every every device has some saving potential. Let's say if a pre sold device is there, it can have a potential of uh, 5%. Then uh, let's say a bulbous bar can have a potential of 3%. Premium pit can have 1% saving potential. So if you add them all up, the saving on the or the fuel efficiency can really go up because that number could be substantial. Yes, so uh, again, this will all depend upon how much investment uh, the ship owner wants to put on their ships uh, because it will all cost money. Uh, for example, uh, 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 a new propeller could uh, go, uh, the investment could go in the tune of uh, let's say 200 to $300,000. A uh, duct could also be uh, something in the value of uh, $200,000. Uh, so one would like to know about the ROI. And I can tell you uh, that uh, that some of the devices even installed can have very attractive ROIs. So it's certainly a, a, a good business case uh, these these ESDs have. So it is all uh, it is also about educating the people, right? I mean, uh, everybody is not uh, educated at the same level. So there are owners which are uh, which are quite uh, educated. They know the the value of these ESTs, and there are some who need some education, uh, some more information, or some more research they want to do on their side. So it is all you know. Uh, there are different types, right? Uh, uh, that is about ESTs. Any questions so far on ESTs? Sir, uh, the so what is about... the thinner used in uh, lube oil? Sorry, thinner, thinner, thinner. No, oil. I don't. In the lube oil, no, I don't think we use any thinner on the lube oil inside but the lube oil. Thin lube and uh, blending and no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Oh, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, the thin lube, thin lube is something a different technology uh, which, where we uh, we mix two different oils. We use the for the system main engine we use uh, one type of oil, and for the cylinder lubrication when the piston is rotating inside is not rotating but it is when it is reciprocating inside the 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 liner it is a different type of oil it is called cylinder oil. So we mix two different types of oil, and we make the oil thinner, so that when the when the when the piston is moving inside the inside the liner the the the, the friction uh, becomes less. And thereby the efficiency is gained. You know, so this is called thin lube. So it is not a thinner that we put in the lube oil. It is two different oils are mixed together and making the oil thinner and less viscous. That is the thin lube. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank okay, you. then then uh, I will move on. Uh, uh, if nothing else, then the last part of my uh, presentation was about the data. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about data because once we install this ESTs on the ship, we have to know how they are performing, uh, how they are doing, how they are faring, and uh, that is where the data becomes very important. So. Uh, we are actually managing number of ships. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, shipping is a, is a he asset heavy industry. The ship owners have invested a lot of money on their ships and they want to make sure that uh, they are maintained in a good condition. And uh, how do we do that? Uh, uh, and here data plays a very important and pivotal role. Uh, or the, the data on the ship can come from uh, from various uh, places. Uh, it can come from equipment. It can come from positioning of the ship. We can see also what are the ambient conditions where the ship is operating. Uh, data can come from vibration uh, monitoring devices, control systems, uh, 
yeah and uh, you know specific fuel oil consumptions and all of that so uh, maintenance data can also come and all this data comes in the in 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 one place and we have to make we have to make sure that all the unwanted data is filtered out and the data which is relevant have to tell us a story and where we can uh, perhaps uh, or probably we can we can understand uh, how the machinery is performing whether we need to do some predictive analysis of the ships of the of the machinery and if some machinery is going to fail soon and things like that so uh, before they fail they have, we have to we have to arrest that failure by 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 maintaining that particular equipment so this is how data is uh, is very important uh, uh, like any other uh, industry like like um, in in um, in airplanes um, also in your uh, in in the in your uh, at your end uh, data is very important right uh, we we cannot uh, work we cannot work blind right we have to have the data capturing and and data analytics uh why data is important again i will have one more slide on that uh, it will help us in maintenance uh, we can plan better we can predict uh, uh, probable fa probable fa failures in the future we can optimize and get our suppliers we can choose our suppliers better uh, we can uh, have performance uh, analysis being done from data uh, we can have scheduling, uh, optimized scheduling, weather, uh, we can have weather routing, we can have improve our financial and operational efficiency by, 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 by data. Uh, uh, operations can get, get better, we can manage our risk, uh, we can mitigate our risks, uh, we can also get, uh, get some uh, learning from data, uh, and we can also benchmark our performance from our peers, with our peers in the industry. Then, uh, sorry. Then we have we can have uh, data to prepare our reporting. We can have uh, we can ha also reduce our premiums that we pay to the insurance companies if we have uh, good data and we can make sense of the data that we are having. Uh, then uh, it can also uh, data can also be used for uh, uh, hum as on the human side of uh, of uh, human aspects, such as we can also have. Uh, I have uh, uh, behavioral insights, cultural mapping, et cetera, of the crew. And uh, data can also help us in sales and marketing uh, avenues as well. Uh, we can have cargo categorization, and we can also tailor our, 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 our offerings and products uh, with the help of data. Yes, and uh, with that, uh, I think that is the last one that uh, I had uh, for, the, for the presentation tonight, today evening. And now with that, I we are open for uh, Q and A. Thank you very much. So, Sir, great, great day was uh, already going on along with the session also. Yes, yes, <laughs> so, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I have one doubt regarding this uh, bulbous bow. Uh, whether uh, you can share some information about the design aspects because in the normal boat or small ships, it is there is no bulbous bow. Uh, whether uh, whether you can share some information rega regarding the design aspects of this bulbous bow? Yeah, sure. Uh, Kiran, I think uh, you should take this. <laughs> if it, that is okay with you. Uh, so when it comes to design of bulbous bow, it depends upon what kind of operational profile we have and the size of ship. Normally, a bulbous bow is you know is uh, there to to you know for for, break, for breaking the wave that comes in front of it. So what's happening now is if the vessels are getting slower because of the operational profile, because the slower you uh, sail, the lesser fuel you consume. So a bulbous bow initially, you know, it was designed so that, you know, the, the wave making resistance can be can be reduced. But now we have we are seeing vessels with no bulbous bow or small bulbous bow. So when it comes to the design part, uh, again, you know, probably I'm not the right person. It should go then then go to a naval architect. Uh, yeah. For to get the design aspect. So, if you have any specific question, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, on on the bulbous bow, probably we can uh, we can have a conversation, or probably uh, we can we can get the answers for you. I just want this basic information. That's all. Okay. Yeah, you can you can write to us or something like that. We can take it offline. Uh, yeah, uh, we can get you some technical details of the bulbous bow because bulbous bow can have various applications. It can also make the ship faster. It can also make ship slower. And as Kiran said, it is uh, basically to reduce the wave making resistance or wave making effort of the ship. So, so uh, more, if you want more, uh, some deeper information about Bulbous Bob, we can of course, uh, you know, get along and we can share that with you. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem.
Uh, yeah. Anything else? Uh, I think we are. Friends, uh, friends, any questions? I think people want to go home now. <laughs> it's already more than an hour now, right? It's we are almost like one hour and twenty minutes into the. So we have got a got a basic idea regarding the basic components of the uh, ship and uh, main aspects of the ship. So yes. we are very new to this field. Uh, of course, uh, this is a. Uh, the information we got from this session is very much encouraging to know more about the ships and this uh, other aspects also, even the design aspects also. So uh, it's a very good session and a very informative session also. Uh, so at present, I invite. Uh, hello, Sabu is yes, there. Yes. Sabu is there. Yeah, yes, I am here. Uh, yeah, I invite Sabu for uh, giving the word of thanks. Yeah. Uh... Mr. Manish Das and Kiran said, if I say in one single line, this webinar is simply great, simply great. <laughs> and and uh, when we had contacted Mr. Manish and Mr. Kiran, and uh, they had no hesitation to uh, present uh, a webinar in this subject. And as we at uh, from KSCB, it was uh, uh, we used to do. A webinar in different uh, subjects. We uh, this uh, maritime industry is a very new uh, new to uh, us, and we had a try for this. Let us go for this maritime, and uh, we contacted Mr. Manish and Mr. Kiran, and both both were uh, really uh, uh, cooperated with us, and uh, we had a good time with you. So, and uh, the presentation is very uh, interesting. And uh, this, uh, this uh, we have this tremendous potential is there for the for power engineers in this uh, maritime industry, and we had got an overall picture of uh, what this uh, ships are and all the vessels are, different types of vessels and how they are managing it, and, and, and uh, the power scenario in the industry, and uh, it was a very wonderful uh, evening. And we had uh, a live uh, YouTube uh, streaming also along with this, and uh, live Facebook streaming also was there. And about 10 to 12 were there in both uh, YouTube and Facebook. And about 55 to 60 uh, were watching you in this uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much uh, from the Kerala State Registry Board Engineers Association. Uh, for to Mr. Manish Das and Mr. Kiran said from Masola, the subsidiary of the Synergy, which is the one of the largest uh, shipping industry, and we had a we are very happy to ha have you both here for uh, this evening for presenting for our association. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very you. much. Uh, Sabu, thank you very much, and uh, we are humbled and uh, and very good to know that uh, we could be of some <laughs> information to you guys, and uh, yeah, and certainly we can we can cooperate in the future. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If there thank any you. information that you want to take offline or you know some detail in, uh, you know information, then of course please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are there at your disposal anytime. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank if, you. If I may, if I may add a few sentences here. Uh, Sabu, uh, first of all, yeah. it's an honor, uh, you know, talking to all of you, and thank you for the opportunity. I think it was uh, it was the other way around. We uh, we felt really humbled and uh, also uh, you know privileged to be given this opportunity to talk to you. I remember Tiju mentioning that you know probably uh, Sabu will Mr. Sabu will reach out to me for making a presentation to the to the entire Kerala State Electricity Board. But at the same time, I must also thank uh, Sabu. For your patience, I mean, it has been, I think, at least more than a month that you have been following That's up right. with us, and you know, trying to set this up. So the kind of patience, the kind of uh, effort that you have put in to make this uh, possible, uh, it's really commendable. I, I thank you for that, and uh, we tried our best. I know it's uh, you know just scratching the surface, uh, but then now that you know a little bit about shipping, if there are any specific uh, topics that we need to be prepared with. Probably we can 
we can look into that maybe in the near future we can come up with one topic and we can discuss in detail that particular topic and we could also get some say uh, subject matter experts to to discuss those things so looking forward uh, to to learn from you and if there is something that we can uh, say come back with do let us know we would be more than happy to do that thank you thank you kiran just thank you for all the good words thank you thank you thank you very much then uh, thank you sir thank you bye bye have bye. a good evening bye bye all of you bye bye yeah bye bye